we love that video probably because over the 22 years, we celebrated 22 years of marriage yesterday. So. Woo! <laughs> and we've, we've had that conversation maybe a couple maybe. hundred times. I don't know. Like, so it's been super fun in these 22 years. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, we're in this house series and uh, tonight our subject is marriage. And, uh, and next week, we're going to talk about being a woman of God. And the week after that, we're going to talk about being a man of God. And uh, then we're going to finish up with legacy building, parenting, grandparenting, mentoring. And uh, so we're just excited about what God wants to speak to us through this house series. We just really believe with all of our hearts as we've been preparing that God wants our households. He wants our homes. He wants mm -hmm. us as individuals. He wants us as married couples. Um, I know there's a lot of singles uh, here tonight, and I'm super excited that you're here yeah. because uh, I want you to be prepared for marriage. Um, or uh, I don't know one person on planet Earth that doesn't have married friends. And so you are going to have someone, a man or a woman, come and complain to you or come and ask you for advice about marriage. And I don't want you to give uh, the world's ideas about marriage. I want you to give what God thinks about marriage. Mm -hmm. And so through this whole series, these five weeks, we're trying to give you, we're going to give you what God thinks about being a woman. Not what the world thinks about being a woman. We want to give you on Father's Day what God thinks about being a man. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so we're just trying to equip you and us. I mean, it's been a great dialogue for us, mm -hmm. as you can imagine, preparing this sort of a message. Um, and practicing it a few times has brought up all sorts of fun yeah, things awesome. along the way. So uh, not only was it our 22nd uh, wedding anniversary yesterday, but Angela's birthday was yesterday. Mm -hmm. So uh, she, she, you know, is quite the party girl. Um, however, um, in the midst of all those parties, um, my father passed away about three and a half weeks ago. And so we had a memorial service for my dad yesterday. So it was a weird in day. Fresno. In Fresno, where it was 105 degrees. degrees. I think it was 109. I don't know. On Mine my, said 105 on, my car. on the car. Oh, yeah, right. my car. It was hot, <laughs> really, really hot. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, that's true. Whatever you say, dear. <laughs> Thanks, Pastor George, for that counsel. Um, so um, I think some of you knew my, my dad died uh, three and a half weeks ago. Some of you didn't. And uh, I just wanted to let you know that. I, you know, we had the memorial yesterday. You know, my father and my relationship, it's hard to describe. Um, it's been pretty, well, I mean, I don't know, maybe it's been consistent. It's been up and down, you know, uh, more down than up probably in the last 25 years. And uh, it's been difficult. And uh, it's been difficult since my mom and dad divorced. And, um, but yesterday was a day of, of nice resolve um, because I heard testimony of how my father came back to Christ Jesus and uh, her testimony of people who were led back to Jesus themselves by, by my father in the last few years. And um, it was about a year ago, if you were here on Father's Day a year ago, then you heard me announce that my dad called me that morning um, to say he was rededicating his life to the Lord in church in Tennessee and, um, and also asked me, to, for, asked me to forgive him of some things and, and asked for forgiveness and, and that sort of a thing. And so this last year has been filled with more reconciliation than, um, I guess, pain and, and distance. And so I'm thankful for that. So mm -hmm. it was a good day. Um, I, you know, she got a princess balloon, pink princess balloon, and we, you know, c commemorated awesome. my father. And so it was kind of a weird day, but we made it through. We did. Um, and that's part of marriage, you know, is every day you don't know what um, to expect. So, uh, but you are taking me to San Francisco. This I am just in case I, I haven't messed up so far today, but you never know, it's always a little, you know, questionable. And so, I am taking her to San Francisco to try to make up for yesterday because <laughs> I made her drive to Fresno in 110 degree heat. So, even though it was 105, but um, <clears throat> so, uh, uh, um, when we got married, we were um, young. And of course, in love is any married couple that's getting, you know, any husband and wife, man and wife that's getting married should be. And we were expectant of great things. Yep. And then we had a couple of wake up calls. There were a couple of things that really shocked us about marriage yep. uh, in the first months, years of marriage. And so, yeah, 
um, I would say the first shock was that it was really hard work. We were super young and super uh, idealistic and super certain about marrying each other. And then, bam, it, we discovered it was really hard work. Yeah, you, you know, look at marriages on the outside, great marriages, and you go, oh, they're they great marriages. And you don't realize that great marriages are hard, right. just like every other marriage is hard. Right, you know? right. When you think like you're taking two very different family systems and two right ways of doing everything and trying to bring them together and make a new family system or a male and female, and we have boys and a girl and the idea of somehow a boy figuring out how to live with a girl and be married is a miracle all by itself. Yeah, we're still trying to figure out what God was trying to accomplish. Right, right <laughs> like, now. what was so. he thinking? <laughs> um, and then our personality is more of an extrovert, and he's more of an introvert. And so trying to bring all of those dynamics together to create one new mm. uh, cohesive, functioning family system and, yeah. and marriage was really hard work. To complicate that was kind of the second shock or reality, and that was that both Angela and I, um, well, at least me. I don't. I don't know about her, but More we were him. we were a mess. You yeah. know, we had our own stuff that we brought. Just kidding. Um, so you know, I brought all these suitcases with me. You know, and it's like, hey, check out these suitcases. Look at what I brought. You know, and I'm talking about emotional suitcases. Right. And uh, she brought her stuff. You know, past relationships and insecurities and all that. We brought all this stuff, and we were like, so not only was it hard, but what made it hard was we were a royal mess. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, then what led us to, that led us to a great secret. And that is that uh, God has us on this earth to learn to love. And what greater privilege than to learn to love somebody like your husband or your wife. This very deep relationship, very personal, intimate relationship. And, uh, and to round that corner was huge for me about 10 years into marriage. So it took maybe 13 years into marriage. It took a while. Um, and it took some books, and it took some reading of God's Word, and I, and, I, and I realized, wow, this great adventure I'm on to learn to love her in all of the hardness, in all of our differences, in all of our mess, my job. I don't, have to, I don't have to know how to love all the women of the world. I need to know how to love one woman, mm -hmm. and it's Angela uh, Harper, then now Angela Daniel. And so to dedicate my life to that was really, really helpful for me. It just, it, it really was transforming. And then for her as well. Mm -hmm. and, and then that kind of moved us into <clears throat> this idea that God has an intention. Mm -hmm. He has a purpose, a plan, a, an intentionality about this thing called marriage. And that is oneness. And so we've entitled this message, Marriage Becoming One, because we really believe that it's God's intention that man and woman become one. In, right. in that marriage relationship. Yeah, and so. I, I was reflecting on <clears throat> what we're sharing. You know, we're cramming like a whole lot into a 30-minute message. And some of what we're going to say is going to sound idealistic. Like, how right. does that really play out in the real world? That's right. But I think if anybody gets to be idealistic, it's God. That's right. Because he's the ideal. And so we're going we're gonna to just point right toward, toward his intention his design and hopefully also toward him like to bring glory to his name because he had a really definite intention for oneness in marriage and, and it's really important for us to communicate that today mm -hmm. and when i was thinking about well how is this um how has how have we made it work how have we done this and um, when you look at paul's teaching about marriage in ephesians chapter 5 a lot of um Marriage messages are based on that passage of scripture which talks about loving your husbands, love your wives, wives submit to your husbands. And a lot of couples have had discussions around that issue of submission and love. And um, Usually around you submit to me. Right. That's usually the discussion <laughs> right. is pretty one way. Or it's a, it's a trigger for us, you know. Yeah. And so, but there's a foundational scripture that comes right before that teaching that often gets just breezed past and I think is really important and really how we've done marriage, like um, how we've made it work in our marriage. And when I, uh, the, the passage is Ephesians, the verse is Ephesians um, it's five right 20, in front of me. 21. No. Yes, 521. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. It's right in front of you. 
It's not in front of I me. I looked back. Th oh, okay. Um, it's right here too. Yes. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And so that's really how I think we do most of our decision making and uh, most of our um, arguing and getting back to oneness is this yeah. mutual submission. Of, right. We're not doing this when we're, we're trying to get to a decision or trying to resolve an issue. It's not a, a, a question of one upping each other or getting the higher ground. It's really how do we fight to get back to oneness? And, and Eric mentioned uh, a couple weeks ago, right, you talked about, rules, yeah. you know, we fight we really fight to understand. We don't fight to win. And so for our fighting, instead of seeing the other person as the opponent, we really are, are fighting a battle to get back to oneness when we've gotten, gone to our separate corners and we're off in... Yeah, and office. you know, sometimes, um, just to kind of qualify how real we are, uh, sometimes uh, it takes us a while to get to that place of like, I'm not fighting to win anymore. I'm right. fighting to understand. Because sometimes I come out fighting to win. Sometimes she comes out fighting to win. Right. And then we kind of have to realize, also, we've made these ground rules and we've discovered these ground rules over time. And, and so that's a, this is a major ground rule for any human relationship. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. <clears throat> that, that speaks of a, a equal value with your fellow mankind but it also speaks to lordship. Uh, there's no other way to say it, but that Jesus Christ and the lordship of Jesus in my life demands mm -hmm. that I work it out with her. Mm -hmm. I don't have an option. The lordship of Christ demands it. The lordship of Christ demands that I work out an issue I have with any of you in the room. I don't have an option to have a grudge or to have an issue or to be bitter toward anyone in this room. The Lordship of Christ. And so it kind of is a ground rule for us. You know, mm -hmm. this God's intentionality is oneness. Mm -hmm. That's what he's after. Mm -hmm. And if that's what the Father's after, that's what we're after. Mm -hmm. Now, this is 22 years of an experiment mm -hmm. that we're, we're now giving you the fruit of, you know. So there were days when we weren't fighting for oneness. Right. You know, I was fighting for myself. Totally. And, and you were fighting for yourself. Um, because this is so difficult, we really believe that God has given us a plan uh, on how to accomplish this. He didn't just say, all right, good luck, guys. Figure out oneness. You know, hope it works. But he really gave us a plan. And so much of what we can um, discover, the answers about life, are in the first three chapters of the Bible. Genesis 1, 2, and 3 are amazing. And so this morning, we're in Genesis chapter 2 with this issue of marriage. And uh, <clears throat> starting at verse 21... Uh, or excuse me, verse 20, um, it says, So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord caused the man to fall into a deep sleep, and while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Uh, then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man. And he brought her to the man. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of, she was taken out of man. And that is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife. And the two, or excuse me, and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. Uh, th there's so much in this paragraph that we could, I mean, we really could spend hours talking about marriage and maybe someday we'll do a marriage seminar and that'll be fun. But um, I, I think we really just want to focus on one verse, but I I've got to say something about the, the last sentence of this paragraph about Adam and his wife being naked and unashamed. Because I think that really speaks to the intimacy and the oneness and the vulnerability uh, that this first couple had. That's God's design, mm -hmm. is that there would be no shame, uh, no comparison, no jockeying for position, that there's just this beautiful innocence, it's oneness and it's mm -hmm. perfection. And how to get there is to do it God's way. There's lots of ways to do marriage. We're not going to argue with how you should do marriage. We're just telling you 
how God would desire you to, you to do marriage so you have fulfillment the way God intended it. And the way God intended it was that marriage would sit on a three-legged stool. And the three legs are in verse 24. Um, leave father and mother, be united to your wife, and the two will become one. That order's important, and all three legs are important. You can't engage in two of the legs and have a great marriage. You've got to engage in all three. Uh, you can't have a marriage where you're not resolving issues. You've got to be united to your wife if there's a, or a husband. If there's a wedge in your relationship, I don't care if you have physical intimacy. If you have great sex and you've left father and mother, if you have not resolved conflict, you're not going to have a great marriage. You may be great at resolving conflict and be united um, and, and, and living at home and being taken care of by mom and dad still, you're not going to have a great marriage. There's going to be issues in your relationship. It's been consistent in all of my years of ministry. It's been consistent in our relationship. If we don't leave stuff, if we don't run back to each other and unite, and we don't have this flow of intimacy between us, then we are on a really shaky platform when it comes to marriage. Mm -hmm. So we're going to unpack these three legs really quick, um, and then we'll kind of circle back for a review. So the first one is to leave father and mother, which we've experienced, just as God planned it, both immediately mm -hmm. and progressively. And I think this is really important for you to understand immediately happened June 4th, 1994. We right. got marriage, signed a document, you know, you shall kiss your bride and, you know, and your dad stopped paying your college. Right. So we were in college when we got married. So my dad said, sure, you can have her hand in marriage, but then you pay for college and you pay car insurance and you guys, it's on you now. You're yeah. a gr grown up yeah. now. We didn't realize it at the time, but what an incredible gift. I mean, we kind of thought at the time, like, really? Like, I feel like you should still pay college. No, we did like, not. Oh, we didn't? No, oh, okay. No, we didn't. Um, <laughs> but I mean, so sometimes the Lord is at work and you don't even know it. And, and this incredible gift, you know, now we look back on it and go, wow, they really respected that boundary right. to put, hey, we bless your marriage and, and we're going to push you out to start something new. You can't start something new if you're still holding on to the past. Right. Um, the, the leaving was also progressive. Uh, my mom and I, you know, had developed a close relationship. My dad's out of the picture. My mom needs help around the house. I had a three-year-old sister, so I helped take care of her. All this stuff's going on. And then this new woman, and I'm married, and now this is the woman in my life, and she's the primary woman. And Man, that takes some time to sort through mm -hmm. and some discussions yes. uh, to sort through and Patience. some some late night walks. Yes. Actually, I had to like find you late at night somewhere in the woods, you know, <laughs> processing things. And, you know, so so there's this progressive. Patience. You forgot the patience part. Patience. Patience. And, and took you were, some patience. You were so wonderful in so many ways. Um, so uh, there, there's this progressive uh, nature of leaving as well. Um, it's not just about leaving mom and dad, though. So it's also figuratively. Um, you know, I, I love to describe, and if you've done pre-marriage counseling with me, then you know, then I say, you know, you, when you leave father and mother, you've got to draw a line in the sand, and it's crossing the point of no return. Until you decide, as a husband and wife, there is no ability for me to leave this woman. So speaking from the man, there's no ability for me to leave this woman. You are going to struggle in your marriage. Bottom line, until you as a woman say, this is it, I'm in this thing. And, and I know, again, we're speaking to a mixed audience and our hearts, we'll talk about it at the end, are, are so broken for you. If you're struggling with your marriage tonight, if, you're, if you've been through a divorce, I walked through that with my mom. We understand that from the perspective uh, that God's heart is for you. But we're just talking about this ideal picture and maybe you for the future, if you're gonna get married, there's got to be a leaving, a leaving of past hurts. Right. You were hurt by guys. I was hurt by girls. I had expectations. You had expectations. We had to leave all that behind, right, to grab on to something new. And that's so important to make the marriage work according to God's plan. Right. Um, which leads us to the second leg, which is to unite. And so if you can envision, I like to use this analogy, if you can envision, um, you know, if, 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 I'm, if I haven't fully left the past, if I just have two fingers free and these three fingers are doing something else and I, and I grab onto this Bible, 
There's only so much strength to grab onto this Bible here. Just take that out of my hand. Super easy to grab that out of my hand. If, why are you laughing? Because I'm anticipating. <laughs> I know. You can't though. If you're um, going to do a joke, then you can't anticipate it in front of the I'm group. That ruins, I'm not doing it. It ruins the whole thing. Okay. Forget it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so if I've got all my hands free, if I've really left the past and I grab onto this Bible, she's going to pull it out. Come on, pull it. Don't pull it, please, because I don't want to look weak. Right. Ah! So uh, I've got to go to the gym more. So, I mean, it, it, it's that <laughs> image that you need to capture in your heart and mind. That if you want this marriage to work, you've got to leave the past so you can fully cling to the present. If you don't, it's just, it's just it doesn't work. It, 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 because you're, you're not able to build the new thing that God's doing. So Right. And then the third leg is uh, becoming one flesh, becoming one. And this is the thing that um, mm -hmm. is most exciting to me, this concept of oneness. When we talk about the flywheel, I think it's on the back wall there that I always get stuck on the very first, the very first thing, establish your life and home in Christ. And this is so much what uh, the foundation of that, we're laying the foundation for our home in, right. in our uh, sub submission to Christ and our oneness with him and then our oneness with each other. Right. And so I want to go back just a little bit in Genesis to uh, Genesis 1, 26 and 27. And it's going back to the creation the story again. And it says that God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Right. And so what I love about this is that the, the switch between plural, uh, the plural and the singular. So one God, the triune God, right? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So here are these three people that exist as one person mm -hmm. and th there's oneness there and that's the model. And then they say, let's make, then they, he, he says, let's make man in our image. And so he makes man and woman both to be image bearers of God the Father. Well, God, the triune God, right? And so I see it like to the flip sides of the same coin, that, that there is an image uh, on each side, right. uh, male and female. And so we, we both are image bearers of God. But I also, it struck me that part of our image bearing is the oneness, because that's what the, the example was. God could have made just one human being, one pattern of humanity. And um, he didn't. He chose to take two and help have us figure out oneness because he wanted us to enjoy that same relationship that, that he, mm -hmm. they, mm -hmm. enjoyed in, in their oneness. Right. And that theme, the theme is throughout the Bible. It's not just in Genesis. This theme of oneness and unity, this image that Angela is giving of the coin, I, I love that because, you know, there's not a greater side to a coin. I mean, heads, tails. I mean, the only reason you would choose is if you're going to flip a coin. There's no greater value to either side. It's just an image on each side that's mm -hmm. different. And um, in Ephesians, the, the chapter you mentioned earlier, Ephesians chapter 5, um, it actually says that uh, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they fed and cared for their own body. And so the parallel here is that, it, you know, that when you love your spouse, you're loving yourself. When you are disrespectful to your spouse, you're disrespectful to yourself. Um, I, I don't know if I've ever seen uh, a one-sided tarnished penny. A penny is either tarnished, both sides, or it's new, right off the mint, you know, both sides. And so this, this image, I just love that, you know, mm -hmm. the, the two sides of the same coin um, picture. Right. And then if we look a little bit further um, down, I wanted to, I kind of went back to the creation of woman right. in particular in Genesis uh, 2.18. It says, the Lord, the Lord God said, it's, it's not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. And I went and looked at the original meaning of that because I think sometimes it gets used in a way that um, is like, you know, his help made, I, I do his laundry and I cook his food and I, Amen. what, what else? <laughs> Take uh, care of his children, yeah, children and, and just and serve him and make life easier for him. <laughs> I do some of those things, but he does too, to, to bless me. But, um, so I went back to look at the original language and the, the words there are Ezer Konegdo. So Ezer is helper. 
And it's interesting that uh, it's defined as helper, but it also has this uh, impression of strength and power, the, the idea of strength and power. And the other times that the word Ezer is used in Genesis is in reference to God. So it's God the helper. God is going to help mankind. So it's not at all a subordinate sort of coming from underneath to help or to come take care of subordinate mm -hmm. stuff. Mm -hmm. It's really bringing your full strength. And, and I was really challenged by this. Like, Lord, am I bringing the full strength of who I am to our marriage to support him in the way that, that he needs to be supported? Um, and it's not a... It's, yeah, so enough said about that. And then... Yeah, we're going to unpack that a little bit more next week you yeah, know, with, the, right. with the woman of God. Woman but of it God. is important. And even I, I, I see you cautioning your words because you, it's a struggle to use the word support because you're not coming alongside to support me, but you're coming alongside to bring that strength opposite me, right. um, like the other side of the coin or this word. You want to right, define that right. word, right? So yeah. here's where I got the coin picture. And the, the word connecto means comparable to him, opposite of him, or the other side. Mm -hmm. So there's the coin idea and then the counterpart. And so, right. so we're the flip side of the same coin in our one, as, as we pursue oneness, mm -hmm. we become the flip side mm -hmm. of the same coin. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think as we've talked together, you know, we've, I, I like, we've come across this phrase, you know, who are you agreeing with? Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, the devil's name uh, means slanderer. And in Greek, um, Diablo, the prefix to his name is the same prefix that's used to cut a circle in half, uh, diameter. It's used uh, dissect. dissect, diagonal. Um, and so, you know, this whole idea of oneness, you're agreeing with somebody. And, and maybe, you, you know, even talking about Jesus. So, if you're Right, so the Diablo is that, it, so, so it's this idea of, um, cutting a circle in half, uh, bringing division, right. and throwing into twos, always mm -hmm. cutting in half. And so in marriage, you know, when, when, when the slanderer comes and whispers things yeah. to you she about... doesn't love me, he doesn't care about me. What's wrong yeah. with them, or <clears throat> blah, 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 the lies. So we get the choose. He choose. didn't do the dishes again. <laughs> we get to choose. That who may be we, real. Maybe that's not slander. Gonna, <laughs> who are we going to agree with? The, he's interrupting me a lot. Yeah, it's disrespectful. <laughs> who are we going to agree with? The, the one who div seeks to divide. So when I find, you know, <clears throat> division, and, I, and this goes beyond our marriage, but really when I'm tempted to want to separate or divide mm -hmm. from somebody, I recognize where is that coming from? Because right. God the Father's desire is oneness and coming together. And so... Uh, it's good to be reminded, wait, if I'm wanting to separate from him, that's the slanderer, and who am I going to agree with him? Yeah, every married couple, when they're in moments alone, start stewing about these issues. And you need to discern, discern right. when the slanderer, the right. devil, is at work, right. and you're you know, doing whatever you're doing, and you're like, right? And you're like, you think, you think you're defending yourself. You think you're justified in your cause. You think you're, and all the while, the devil is like slicing your marriage in half or your parenting or your, you know, your neighborhood or your church or, you know, and, and so it's either that you're agreeing with when you receive those thoughts or you're agreeing with the unifier. Right. God who sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on a cross for you and for me and for our marriage to have unity. Mm -hmm. so. What I, what I loved in our study about oneness was, you know, way back at creation, God's design was oneness. But then when you go all the way to the end of Jesus's ministry, when he's just about to go to the cross, the thing that Jesus was really concerned about was this issue. This was his, his and, and I, it struck me this week, like, oh my gosh, it, we, so many of us have unanswered prayers, things that we're still waiting for. And I thought, Jesus Jesus has an unanswered prayer, and it's yeah. for our oneness. This is the thing that's in his heart that he longed for. It says, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also, he was talking about his disciples. Sorry, this is John 17, um, verse 20 and on. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me that they may be one as we are one. 
I and them and you and me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. That the world will know that you sent me and love them even as you have loved me. And so here is Jesus in the garden about to go to the cross. And the thing that he's so concerned about is our oneness. And, and obviously that's way beyond marriage. He wants oneness here in this community. Mm -hmm. He wants oneness. His desire for us is to know the intimacy and the connectedness that he has with the Father. That is a, mm -hmm. a, something so far higher than mm -hmm. what we can conceive of. Yeah. <clears throat> and... Um, I think it's really cool that that's, but, I, but marriage, you know, is set up as sort of this pinnacle of that oneness, the, yeah, the yeah. supreme example of oneness. Um, uh, we, we find this extremely encouraging because this is God's desire for us mm -hmm. as married couples. Or if you're single, wanting to be married, this is God's desire for you. And so if it's God's desire for you, if it's his plan, then he is going to help you accomplish it. God doesn't ever give us an assignment. You'll never find it in all of Scripture where God gives you an assignment and says, good luck. God gives an assignment of oneness or of oneness in the body of Christ. And he says, I'm going to give you the fuel. I'm going to give you the tools. I'm going to give you all that you need to work this out. And so that, of course, uh, we want this to be a message of hope to you in the room <clears throat> that you know, this is God's plan. Therefore, it is doable. Mm -hmm. And we know there's some people at Hillside and, and your spouse isn't a believer. And, and what a difficult position to be in uh, if one of you, uh, you know, husband or wife's not a believer in Jesus Christ. It takes two to dance and you feel like you're dancing alone. Um, pray. We're praying with you. You need to know that. We're praying with you. We believe in a God of miracles and we pray that, you know, there'll be an equally yoked, um, you know, sense in your marriage um, as you work through these issues. Um, we're, we're, we're kind of running out of time, and so let me like re, you know, just, just kind of review these uh, three legs of the stool. Uh, leave father and mother, be united to your wife, the scripture says, husband for, you know, wives, and they will become one. Uh, that oneness, we haven't really touched on it. It's, 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 a, it's a oneness emotionally. It's a oneness mentally. It's a oneness physically, um, sexual relationship. Um, and so it's all spoken of there in those three legs. Um, let me just say a brief word uh, about um, engaging in uh, these legs of marriage um, out of order. Uh, there's a, a major problem in the church today. Um, it's even being encouraged by parents with their kids, Christian parents encouraging their kids to live together before marriage. Um, we have a very sexual culture today. I don't know if the culture is any more sexual than it used to be, but cell phones um, have made it even more, you know, um, I guess in front of us all the time. Um, and so, you know, there's lots of premarital sex going on. Um, and again, that's probably not new. Maybe we just know more about it. But you need to know you're on dangerous ground because you're engaging in the legs of the marriage stool without you know, God's blessing and without the proper order of those things. <clears throat> you have to leave father and mother. You have to be united to your wife and then they become one in sexual intimacy and in emotional intimacy. We have couples come to us <clears throat> um, and they'll say, we're going to live together before marriage. We want to test it out. And pastor, we're going to be pure. We're not going to become one, you know. And uh, one, I'm not sure how you do that. Just, you know, how you can be in the same house and not have sexual relation. But it's, it's not a good idea to play house because you are creating a false reality. You're going to live with that person for six months. You're going to live with that person for a year. You're going to try not to have sex, which is just stupid. And then you've not left mom and dad officially. And you're, you're doing this artificial thing. And the reason it's artificial is because... Um, People uh, don't uh, let down this guardedness they have until they become secure. And this is the great challenge of marriage. You think you're marrying somebody, and the moment you marry them, they changed. And if I ask all the married couples in the room, I'd go, hey, do you think your spouse has changed? They'd be like, oh, yeah, she totally, he totally changed. I'll tell you right now, I've been married to three Angelas. <laughs> At least three. 
um, probably be married to like six by the time we're done, you know? I, I was married to the Angela who was a school teacher. Well, I guess I was married maybe four. I was married to the false Angela when we were dating on June we 4th. Married. Yeah, I wasn't oh, married, so, you I know. See, see. So I was married to the teacher, Angela. She was a school teacher. I was married to the preschool mom. Uh, and now I'm married to this, this woman who's got all of her kids in school. And so she keeps changing. And guess what? I have to keep leaving my previous expectations about her. If I treat her and, and think of her as I did 15 years ago, oh man, if I'm in that rut still, we're in, we're in dangerous territory. I've got to continually leave that past. And so uh, she, she's able to be who she is with me because of security. And that only happens on the wedding day. When you sign that document, there is something mysterious. There's something magical. There's something divine. And you think you're outsmarting God, mm -hmm. but you're not. You've created a false reality. The day you get married, you're going to be back in my office and go, I lived with him for six months. I thought I knew him. It's not the way God designed it. If you're having sex outside of marriage, trying to engage in that third leg of the stool, and you haven't leave mom and dad, you haven't left the past, you haven't united to your wife, then what you're doing is you are uniting with somebody. And if that relationship dissolves, you're going to leave a piece of yourself with that somebody. And you do that over and over and over again in the sexual relationship. You leave pieces of yourself and your ability to cling becomes weakened. There's a book out called Invisible Bond. It's all about sexuality and the invisible bond that's created by sex. Again, you can't avoid it. You cannot avoid it. It's the way God has designed it. If you have sexual relations with somebody, you are bonded to them. And so that's why it's so difficult to break off a relationship with somebody who's abusive that is sexual. It's much easier to break off a relationship. And some of you have probably had to do it. You break off a relationship with somebody and there's no sexual acts involved. It's much, much easier. Why? Because of the bond that God has created in that sexual relationship. And so we can't emphasize enough. And I know I'm bringing a little preachy, but it's just a real problem. We, we have long drives home and we're like, oh, the devil is tricking you. He's tricking you. He's duping you to engage in the legs of the marriage stool and, and out of order. And so, uh, you know, it requires a little preachiness, right? It does. And it's important to say that he is the restorer Absolutely. and the redeemer. Yep. And that... Never that, too late to start. Right. It's never too late to, to yeah. bring um, healing and wholeness and purity to a yeah. relationship. Yeah. Um, we, we want to uh, bless you that are married in the room with the prayer over you tonight. Um, but we also want to give you an opportunity if you're in the room. Uh, you should have received a little white card on the chair next to you. And we want to give you, you'll see these boards up here. Um, <clears throat> these are our, our altar boards. Uh, in the Old Testament, you know, they would bring things to the altar and they would sacrifice them. And uh, if you're a married couple or a married individual, maybe your spouse isn't here. Uh, we want to pray over you tonight. And, and we're just mindful that we've unearthed some things. And uh, we've got great elders here that want to pray over you, want to minister to you. If you, have, if you need counseling, if you need prayer, Angela and I are available tonight. Uh, Pastor Jordan's here tonight. So, but, but we want to we sacrifice some things. You know, as we talk tonight, maybe you realized, man, I haven't left that relationship. I haven't left that expectation. I haven't left that wounding. Uh, and tonight you want to leave that on one of these boards and what we're going to do is we're going to leave these up every week over the next four weeks of this house series. We're going to sacrifice stuff every week. Next week, we'll sacrifice some womanhood issues. And next, the week after that, some manhood issues. And well, I mean, we'll just, Lord, we want to give you our house. Mm -hmm. We want you to have our house. Mm -hmm. And so you're going to see these each week. We're, just, we're not going to take the cards down. We're just going to leave them up. So you remember, man, that died on June 5th, 2016. Um, if, you're, if you want to lay down another issue tonight, absolutely, please. This is for all of us. Um, maybe it's the dream of having a spouse and you've been trying to do it the world's way. And you want to lay down, man, purity. I'm going to lay down my sexuality tonight. I'm going to lay down playing house and trying to work it out in my own strength and I'm going to give it to God. Or maybe it has nothing to do with marriage at all. <clears throat> um, because if you're not a Christian, 
the three legs of the stool of marriage is also what you need to do if you're going to follow Jesus. You need to leave the past behind. And you need to cling to Jesus. You need to become one with him. You need to give your life to Jesus. And so maybe tonight you want to, I give you my life, Jesus. <laughs> give you the whole thing. Um, or maybe it's just a small area. So uh, you're going to write on the cards. We're going to sing a song. You're going to put the cards up here. But before we do that, can all the married couples stand? Please stand. Even if your spouse isn't here, just stand with us tonight. <clears throat> We're proud of you. We're thankful for you. We want to bless you. We want to pray for you. We know it is extremely difficult. Uh, we can't emphasize enough how hard it is. How hard it is. And uh, we want God to help you. You need God to help you. We need God to help us. Um, it is so hard. And so we want to bless you. So, Father God, we do right now. We pray over the men and women in this room, the marriages in this room. Some, Lord, are hanging on by a thread. And it's difficult. And there, there's, there's a, 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 an unknown about the future. Lord, we just pray tonight. We ask yes. for your blessing. We ask for your wisdom. Yes, sir. Lord, I pray specifically for the men in the room that you would help us to be compassionate, that you would help us to understand, to be loving, to be forgiving, to be patient. God, that you would help us to lead our families, that you would help us to lead our own lives as we lead our families, that it wouldn't just be a domineering thing, but we would just run after you, Jesus. And in running after you, we would find our marriages and our families and our households running after you as well. I just lift up the men to you, God. Help us, Lord. We desperately need your help, Jesus. And Father, I pray for us as wives that we would be able to um, be uh, strength, bring yes, full strength of who we are to our marriages in a way that is respectful and honoring yes, Lord. and uh, glorifies you. Lord, help us. I know that we struggle. Jesus. Um, in the body with with addiction issues in, in families, with abuse issues in families. Lord, give us wisdom and bring healing and wholeness to marriages, we pray. We want hillside marriages to be the best, yes. most beautiful, yes. lifelong, um, glorious, God-honoring marriages in Napa. And, and we want you to be lifted up. Yes, Jesus. In a, such a beautiful way. And then Lord, we want to lay a foundation for our families that our children right. would see marriage and understand it as a concept of oneness, yes, of Lord. connectedness. And we want to be connected to them. And then we want them to have incredible, blessed yes, marriages as they've seen that modeled. Yes, and so Lord, th tonight we want to lay a solid foundation in our homes of oneness with you and oneness with our, with our spouses. And we pray, God, for healing and wholeness where there is brokenness. And we trust you, Lord. We trust you tonight that you're going to do these things in Jesus' name.